Hey guys, Pete here. Today I'm going to talk about the ending of the movie I'm Thinking of Ending Things, which just premiered on Netflix. At first glance, this story is about a young woman going to meet her boyfriend Jake's parents for the very first time. The relationship is still new. They have only been together for six or maybe seven weeks, and the title seems to come from her thinking about ending it. On the way to his family farm, we get hints that this is anything but a simple story. When they arrive, it's clear that things aren't what they seem, or at least they're distorted in some way. By the time his parents start appearing at different ages, it seems pretty obvious that what the couple is experiencing isn't real. But if it's not that, then what is it? And why does her name and job and what she's studying keep changing? And what's up with the shots of a janitor doing his job at a high school? Is his scraping gum off of a chair somehow relevant to their relationship? Before I get into answering those questions, I'll say that I think the ending is somewhat ambiguous. I know how the book of the same name it's based on ends, and while there are a lot of similarities with the source material, the ending doesn't play out in the same way on screen. As a warning, from this point on there will be spoilers about the ending of Charlie Kaufman's I'm Thinking of Ending Things. If you haven't seen the film, this video won't be for you and this is your chance to leave. The title of the movie says it all. The story is about thinking of ending things. It's introduced to us in a way that makes us think it's about the relationship. There is another way to interpret this saying though, which is I'm thinking of committing suicide, and that's actually how the book ends. Most of what we see in this movie doesn't actually take place, not in the real world anyway. It happens inside the head of the janitor at the high school. He's the real Jake, and the younger version, who takes his new girlfriend to meet his parents, is how he thinks of or remembers himself. This might not seem clear the first time you watch the movie, but if you go back to look, there will be several clues you can't miss. For example, we see the janitor in the farmhouse before we know what it looks like, and we see his thermos and slippers both there and at the school. Of course, the big one that jumps out is his work uniforms in the washing machine after he was so concerned about her not going down there. I'm thinking of ending things is the story about existence, the subjective nature of how we form our identity, and the way we interpret the memories inside our own head. The presentation is confusing and disorienting, and the movie is less concerned delivering a coherent definitive ending than the book was. If you came into it cold, there's no shame in feeling unsure of what you just saw happen. Probably the biggest hurdle to piecing things together is that the narration is in the young woman's voice. That is how Jesse Buckley's character is credited, and the fact that her name is constantly changing, along with everything else about her, leads us to understand that what we're seeing is a product of Jake the Janitor's imagination. Most of the conversations are of the imagined variety, but there still are some truths buried in the thoughts that bounce around in between the characters. One of those is delivered in the school when the young woman, who I'll refer to as Lucy from here on out, talks to the janitor. She tells him, we never even talked as the truth. I'm not even sure I registered him. There were a lot of people. As she continues to describe the encounter, we realize that this is really what happened at the trivia night from the story Lucy told over dinner. Jake didn't slip her his number like she told his parents. Instead, he creeped her out by staring at her and they never spoke to each other. This explains the inconsistencies with her name, with what she's wearing, with what she does for a living, and the shifts in the way they relate to each other. Lucy's voice is what we hear in the narration, but it comes from Jake's mind where he's trying out different things. He tries to imagine a version of the girl he saw that night in the bar and what might have happened if they became a couple, how they would talk about their interests, how they might have made a relationship work, how she might have won over his family before they died, and his underlying insecurity that she might have just wanted to leave him if she got to know him anyway. When they look at the picture on the wall, Lucy thinks it looks like her, even though Jake says it's him as a child. They're both right because they are the same person. We get a glimpse of where his ideas for her come from when she enters his childhood bedroom. The bookshelf is filled with books related to the topics they discussed and the different professions that she had. 
This is underlined when she picks up Eva H.D.'s book of poetry, Rotten Perfect Mouth, which is open to the poem she recited as her own in the car earlier. If you need more evidence that this version of Lucy only exists in Jake's mind, there's plenty. In the car, she says, I feel like I was that wind tonight, blowing through Jake's parents, seeing them as they were, seeing them as they will be, seeing them after they're gone when only I'm left. As they age, de-age, and age again, we begin to understand that Jake never left home. Instead, he watched them decline into their old age and remembers it as he's now growing old himself. At this point in the story, they're gone, and he lives on in the house alone. So if Jake and Lucy never met, then why is he thinking about what things might have been like if they were a couple? There are several examples during their conversations where Jake slips in anecdotes from his real life. These mostly relate to the students and how he sees them, but there's an exchange just before they arrive at Tulsi Town where we get an insight into his headspace and the hopelessness that resides there. Like feeling old, like your body is going, your hearing, your sight, you can't see, and you're invisible, and you've made so many wrong turns, he says. The lie of it all, that it's going to get better, that it's never too late, that God has a plan for you, that age is just a number, that it's always darkest before the dawn, that every cloud has a fucking silver lining, that there's someone for everyone. We get the idea that Jake has been trying to construct a way that his life could have turned out better inside his head for some time. He can't find a way to make it work, as even his made-up, idealized version of his girlfriend is planning to end their relationship. There's also the repeated phone calls she receives throughout the evening. The name of the caller changes to whatever name she's being referred to at that point in the story. When she listens to the voicemail, we hear a man's voice say that there's only one question to resolve. On the screen, it's never made clear what that question is, but in the book we find out it's, what are you waiting for. These are Jake the Janitor's intrusive thoughts of ending things creeping into his imaginary road trip with his girlfriend. And yes, when you think about it that way, it is rather dark. An aging man unsatisfied with the way things turned out contemplating suicide. But to his credit, Charlie Kaufman does present this in a less dark way than the book does. The janitor is confronted with the reality of what the young woman he saw at the trivia night remembered about him. He was a creeper, you know. I can't remember what he looks like. Why would I? Nothing happened. Just one of thousands of such non-interactions in my life. It's like asking me to describe a mosquito that bit me 40 years ago. After that, she's reunited with the younger version of Jake, and we watch as two dancers dressed in their same clothes step in to take their place. In dance, we watch as the delusion of what might have been plays out. They meet, fall in love, and even get married before a dancing janitor enters the picture to try to take the girlfriend away. There's a fight that ends when the janitor stabs and kills the dancer who represents the younger Jake, taking the girlfriend for himself. This symbolizes the end of the idea that Jake can dream up a way where his life turns out to be something better. He finishes up his shift and walks outside to his car in the middle of a blizzard. It's not clear how it happens, suicide or freezing to death or suicide by freezing to death, but we have to imagine he dies after he gets there. His walk down the hall, naked with the cartoon pig, feels like a confirmation that he's no longer with us. After that, we see not the janitor, but an aged up version of Jesse Plemons playing an older Jake. In his theater makeup, he receives an award with aged up versions of Lucy and his parents in the crowd watching. From the podium, he tells Lucy, you are the reason I am. You are all my reasons. Which is a line you might recognize from the movie A Beautiful Mind, the DVD of which we saw in his childhood bedroom sitting on top of the books on the bookshelf. So this seems like another example of his fantasy crafting. From there, we depart from the ending of the book and lean way harder into the play Oklahoma. We see a version of his room converted into a shack in the style of the play. He sings a song called Lonely Room, which is about the bad guy in the story getting the girl he wants. 
To be honest, I'm not very familiar with the play as I've never seen it, but it appears that at one point the hero visits the same villain and suggests that he kill himself. That seems pretty interesting to me as someone who has no idea about the play, other than, you know, it's a famous play that's been around for quite some time, I wouldn't have expected that to be there. In the book's ending, none of the Oklahoma stuff is included. The janitor just kills himself, and the book turns out to be based on journals he wrote about his imaginary life life with Lucy that were found next to his body. I guess dream ballet and a musical number are slightly more palatable, but in the end it's still pretty tragic. As a person who admittedly spends too much time in my own head, I view it as a cautionary tale and not completely a downer. I also like the angle of how we create this image of ourselves based on how we interact with the things that we like and how we then project that onto others. This is a particularly bleak circumstance, Jake the Janitor's life and its ending, but the existential questions it asks are still quite relatable. It strikes me as the kind of movie people will either love or hate. I don't see a lot of people being indifferent about it. I think in the end, it's not as much a puzzle to be solved, but rather a story that reveals itself to have more layers to unearth once you understand what happened. I thought the performances were great across the board, but Jessie Buckley does stand out as she changes so much between each scene. The subtle costume changes really stand out when you watch it again, and the aspect ratio works to add to the tension once you get used to it. I really enjoyed it, and with that I'll bring this video to an end. Let me know in the comments what you thought about the movie and any other questions you might have about the ending. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.